glassware that sparkles and glints, gleaming goblets and cups etched with fine geometric patterns that catch and reflect the light. This is the appeal of the Japanese crystal ware known as Kiriko. Glass tableware makes a beautiful setting for Japanese cuisine. The technique for making cut glass was originally introduced from abroad. Adapted and refined by Japanese craftsmen, it became Kiriko. The appeal of fine crystal glass was traditionally likened to that of beautiful women. The fragile light that plays across the facets of cut glass fits the Japanese aesthetic. These days, Kiriko is finding fresh applications. Glass artisans are experimenting with new uses, such as making decorative casings for computers. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we discover Kiriko, the tradition of cut glass that has developed a distinctive beauty all its own in Japan. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I've come to the Sumida area of eastern Tokyo to visit a showroom that specializes in cut glass. Let's take a look inside. And our topic for today is this, it's Kiriko, or Japanese lead crystal cut glass. Take a look at the distinctive colors of it and the geometric patterns as well. Kiriko is created by cutting numerous intersecting lines into the surface of the glass, which then refract and reflect the light in a rather wonderful way. The art of cut glass originally came to Japan from Europe, but once it got here, the Japanese artisans began to incorporate their own modifications and innovations. First of all, let's take a look at what it is that makes Kiriko distinctive. Inside the precincts of the Kameido Tenjin Shrine in Tokyo stands a traditional Japanese restaurant. During the summer months, many of the courses are served on tableware made of Kiriko glassware. The gleam of the transparent glass conveys a refreshing sense of coolness. At the same time, it makes the whole meal seem more elegant. Kiriko goes very well in combination with other tableware and really helps to show off each course to its best. Our customers really appreciate our Kiriko tableware. People like to use Kiriko in their homes as well. For the Ito family, collecting Kiriko is a hobby. They have many pieces in a variety of shapes and patterns which they select to complement whatever they're eating on a particular day. With Kiriko to adorn the table, even an everyday meal has a luxurious feel. When I'm thinking about what to make for dinner, I'll think, well, this lettuce would look even more delicious on that dish. Even if it's just a single sausage on its own, a Kiriko dish can make it seem appetizing. It really does make meals fun. In Japanese cuisine, great emphasis is placed on the presentation. When preparing a meal, besides considering the taste, plenty of thought has to go into the colors and shapes of the ingredients, as well as the overall presentation. The gleam of Kiriko crystal adds a further dimension to the exquisite appearance of a traditional Japanese meal. There are various kinds of Kiriko. This style is called Edo Kiriko. It was made during the 19th century in Edo, the old name for Tokyo. In the old days, this kind of ware was made from clear glass that was not coloured. The distinguishing mark of Edo Kiriko is the smoothness of the cuts. Viewed close up from the side, the gentle rounded edges can be seen. They are all handcrafted. As you slowly move a piece of Edo Kiriko glassware, a faint iridescence becomes visible. This is lead glass. 
When you hold it in your hands, it feels as if it has a coating of oil. Although the surface is smooth, these cuts have a powerful feel. I think that's part of the allure. Over the years, the surface undergoes a slight chemical change. The result is that lovely rainbow effect. This three-tiered container is considered a masterpiece of Edo Kiriko craftsmanship. As it slowly rotates, the intricate cuts on its surface shimmer, creating little rainbow glints of light. Ranked alongside Edo Kiriko, there is Satsuma Kiriko, which was made in Satsuma, the old name for Kagoshima Prefecture. Satsuma Kiriko was produced in the middle of the 19th century, during the closing years of the Edo Shogunate. Unlike the clear Edo Kiriko, Satsuma Kiriko often featured coloured glass, usually red or blue. It was also usually worked with narrow, sharper incisions. One of the features of Satsuma Kiriko is the gradation in the depth of the colours, an effect known as bokashi. If you examine the facets of this glass, you can see that the red coloration gradually fades into the clear glass. This bokashi technique is a distinctive feature of Japanese glassware. Kiriko ware is used for various purposes not just for the dining table. These lampshades are also produced using Kiriko techniques. They're cut with gentle curving incisions to produce floral motifs. Their designs show the influence of the Art Deco movement in Europe. Even street lamps have been made from Kiriko. The light refracted through this lattice of cut glass gives off a warm glow onto the city streets. Kiriko can also be crafted to form clock frames, pendants, and other kinds of jewelry. The tradition of Kiriko has become an important part of Japan's culinary culture. It can also be found in items used in other aspects of daily life. This is the workshop around the back of the showroom, and this is Mr. Seki, who's been making Kiriko for some 60 years now. And he's very kindly allowed me to have a go at doing this. This is the lathe here where you do the cutting. This is a glass that's already been cut and I have to try and do something like the base of this. So I'm gonna put this here to give me an idea. He's already cut two lines in here and I have to cut, some, uh, cut something on the diagonal here between them. Let's see, see if I can do something without absolutely destroying his piece of work here. Oh, you can see a line appearing before my very eyes. Wow. Oh, it's not as impossible as I thought it might be. Let's see if I can do another one now. Lines here pay more attention, I think. It's kind of difficult centering this. Ah, I think I've got it a little bit off. I expect a seasoned craftsman would have a way of fixing that, but I may have screwed up a little bit. Oh. Do this ka ne? Do shiroto. Shiroto ne ski wa ne, jou de iyu desu yo. So desu ka? Hajimeru desu yo ne. Not bad for a first try maybe. Well, that's how mine ended up looking and that's how it looks when a professional does it. Anyway, let's take a look now at how the real pros do it. Kiriko starts with the glass making process. The main ingredients in Kiriko glass are pulverized silica, saltpeter and lead. These are mixed together and melted in a furnace at 1150 degrees Celsius. 
The glass used for Kiriko has a relatively high lead content. The molten glass is placed in a mould. Air is blown into it and then the glass is severed. A second type of glass is then placed on top of the glass left inside the mould. This creates a vessel composed of layers of clear and coloured glass. The next stage is to cut it. This is the process by which the pattern is incised into the glass. Nowadays, the cutting process is done with rotating disc-shaped grinding wheels. Wherever the edge of the grinding wheel comes into contact with the glass, it scrapes away some of the surface. As it grinds away the outer layer of colored glass, the inner layer of clear glass appears. This is how the craftsmen create their complex decorative patterns. There are industrial diamonds embedded in the cutting edges of the grinding wheels, which make them hard enough to strip away glass. The alignment and depth of each incision must be precise to the millimeter. This requires the skill of artisans with long years of experience. A finished Kiriko dish. The geometric pattern that's been incised into the design is a traditional octagonal basket weave motif. It's the intricacy of the craftsman's incisions that gives Kiriko ware its alluring glitter. Satsuma Kiriko is known for its vibrant colors. It also boasts the distinctively Japanese technique of bokashi, subtle shadings of color. The secret to this Satsuma style bokashi effect was that when the colored overlay glass was added, it wasn't done in a mold. Instead, the craftsman applied the molten glass directly. This produced vessels that had thicker surface layers. The difference is clear when seen in cross-section. The vessel on the right was made with layers of clear and colored glass fused inside a mold. On the left, the colored glass has been overlaid manually in the Satsuma Kiriko style, producing a thicker outer layer. This layer of colored glass is then ground away. A range of gradations can be achieved by varying the angle at which the cuts are made. The grinder cuts through the colored layer of glass on the outside into the clear layer underneath. The further the grinder penetrates, the lighter the color that is exposed. It's this gradation that appears in the cutting process which creates the Bokashi effect. This Satsuma Kiriko bowl was made in the middle of the 19th century. The cuts that form the checkerboard pattern show off the Bokashi effect. These subtle gradations imbue the vessel with a refined elegance. It's thanks to the exquisite skills of the craftsman that Kiriko derives its soft, glittering beauty. There's an exhibition of Satsuma Kiriko taking place here, so let's go inside and take a look. Glass was originally introduced to Japan through Nagasaki, but the first domestic production of lead crystal glass was made in Edo, the shogun's capital. We have a few examples here of European cut glass. And then, starting here, here's some Edo Kiriko. If you compare it with the European glass, the European one has a much sharper look to it. The Edo Kiriko is a softer kind of line, and it's that soft gentleness which gives it its allure. Satsuma Kiriko ware was originally produced by craftsmen who were invited to move from Edo to the Satsuma domain in the far southwest of Japan. 
and the colors, this deep wine red and indigo blue, are representative of the style. One of the greatest characteristics of Satsuma Kiriko is what's known as bokashi, or gradation. It's seen to great effect in this piece here. It's almost like a watercolor wash, as if some red ink had been dissolved in water. This gradation effect is something the Japanese seem to have an affinity for. You'll see similar things in the prints of Hiroshige, for example, also in kimono design. And even in modern Japan, you'll see it even in the shirt that I'm wearing now. Let's move on and take a look at the origins of Kiriko and how it developed in Japan. Glassware was first introduced to Japan in ancient times. In the old capital, Nara, the Shosoin treasure house includes in its collection a cut glass bowl thought to have been made in Persia in the 6th century. The bowl stands about 8 centimeters high. Its surface is cut in the traditional six-sided turtleback pattern. It was carried from Persia to China and then on to Japan. In those days, imported glass was extremely rare and precious. It was not until the middle of the 16th century that European glass arrived in Japan in significant quantities. The Jesuit missionary, Francis Xavier, presented items made of glass, including eyeglasses, as gifts for Japan's feudal lords. Under the Edo shogunate, Nagasaki was Japan's sole gateway to the outside world. It was here the glass making was introduced from China, and from the 18th century it started to be produced in Japan. Known as bidoro, from the Portuguese word vidro, glass produced at that time was made by the glass blowing method. Its beauty captivated the people of Japan. This woodblock print shows a glass cellar during the Edo period. The shopkeeper can be seen removing a glass vessel from a box. In the front, various smaller bottles are displayed. This is an indication that the use of glass was becoming more widespread. With their delicate appearance and translucent color, glass objects became synonymous with beauty. They were even compared to beautiful women. This woodblock print by the renowned ukiyo-e artist Utamaro is one of a series of pictures of notable beauties. A courtesan dressed in kimono is blowing into a glass toy called a poppin. This picture combining the motif of glassware with female beauty was very popular. At that time, European cut glass was being imported into Japan by Dutch merchants who had a monopoly on Western trade with Japan. As a result, the Japanese word for cut glass was giaman, a corruption of the Dutch word for diamond. These giaman pieces come from Bohemia. Grinding wheels were already being used in Europe to create sharp linear designs. The boundaries between the colored glass layer and the clear glass were also very distinct. Japanese artisans set out to replicate this type of cut glass. This workshop has recreated the manufacturing methods used at that time. Because there were no grinding wheels in Edo, rods of iron and wood had to be used instead. An abrasive slurry was applied to the glass as the artisan carefully ground incisions into it. Grinding glass without any mechanical assistance was a task that required long perseverance. Here is a piece of Edo Kiriko glassware made at that time. Compared to the imported European lead crystal, the cuts are more rounded. Since Japanese Kiriko was worked by hand rather than with machines, it acquired a distinctive soft-edged quality. Glassmaking was still in its infancy in Japan, and Kiriko ware was brittle and easily broken. This kind of crystal ware was still a luxury well beyond the reach of ordinary people. Cutting glass this way produced items that had soft edges and were fragile. This dovetailed well with the prevailing aesthetic sense in Japan. 
For the people of Edo, glassware like this must have seemed incredibly beautiful and at the same time very fragile. That made them extremely fond of glass objects, even more than people today. The second half of the 19th century saw the end of the shogunate and the start of a period of rapid modernization in Japan. Factories were set up for the mass production of glass and its use soon spread, becoming an integral part of life for people around the country. The early decades of the 20th century saw numerous Western influences spread into Japan, such as the Art Deco movement. These spawned numerous variations in the applications and designs for Kiriko. But despite these new trends, glassware in Japan continued to reflect the gentle aesthetic of Edo Kiriko. This piece was made in the 1930s. In terms of design as well, it could be said that the Japanese sensibility is reflected in the craftsmanship of the artisans, in the way they made their incisions in the glass. When you pick up these objects in your hand to admire them, you can feel the incisions are smooth and gentle. Even though various techniques and styles have been introduced from abroad over the years, the craft of Kiriko that developed in Japan has preserved its distinctive, gentle quality. As we just saw in the video, Japan's glassmaking has made huge strides since the second half of the 19th century. Up to that time, Satsuma Kiriko was largely considered a high-end luxury product. In fact, Satsuma Kiriko was only produced for a period of less than 20 years in the mid-19th century. However, the level of craftsmanship was extremely high. Take a look at these, these little miniature Kiriko items created for a dolls festival display. The level of the detail is so meticulous, it's really quite amazing. The Japanese are masters of taking elements from foreign cultures and then adapting them to their own use. And Kiriko is a classic example of that. That ability to adapt is still at work, as we're about to see. The city of Hagi in Yamaguchi Prefecture was another center of Kiriko production during the 19th century. For just a short time, as the Edo shogunate came to a close in the middle of the century, cut glass work known as Hagi Kiriko was made there. But it never achieved the level of prominence enjoyed by the Satsuma or Edo styles. It was soon totally forgotten, even by local people. But one man has unearthed that lost history and is striving to re-establish the Kiriko of Hagi. His name is Kotaro Fujita. Fujita's aim is to make Hagi Kiriko in a way that reflects the local area. He was determined to produce glass using the quartz basalt rock that's quarried in the area and which is used for building walls and other structures. Quartz basalt contains high levels of potassium and can be used to make a hard type of glass called potash glass. The quartz basalt that comes from Hagi also has a lot of iron in it. This imparts a distinctive pale green color to the glass made from this rock. The green tinged glass then has to be cut by hand. Because of its hardness, the design is rendered using shallow incisions. Unlike the soft lead glass of Edo Kiriko and Satsuma Kiriko, our glass is hard. But we concentrate on trying to cut our pieces in a way that gives them a soft feel. 
Here's an example of the reborn Hagi Kirika. The glass has a distinct pale green tinge and it's cut with shallow incisions. It's decorated with floral motifs, which makes it rather different from other styles of Kirika. Hagi Kirika, once consigned to a dusty corner in the history of Japanese glasswork, has been resurrected through the skill and passion of Fujita and his team. Tokyo is where the craft of Edo Kiriko was born. Here, craftsman Kenji Kumakura is taking the tradition of Kiriko in bold new directions. He's creating a glass casing for a personal computer. Even people who don't know about Kiriko are likely to know about computers. Working with modern day electronic equipment like this is the perfect way to generate greater awareness of this traditional craft. Kumakura has cut an intricate design into the casing. I thought it would be interesting to apply traditional craftsmanship to a computer, so I made this Kiriko computer casing. Kiriko may be a traditional craft, but it has to keep in step with the times. That's why I decided to create it. Kiriko has always been sustained by innovation, and great efforts are continuing these days to keep it relevant to contemporary life. As I mentioned earlier on, Satsuma Kiriko was originally only produced for a period of about a dozen years, but there are new initiatives now taking place. About 20 years ago, a movement was launched to revive the craft, and in addition to the classic red, blue, green and yellow colors, new ones such as purple have also been added. There are also a growing number of young people starting to come into the craft as apprentices. A number of Japanese traditional crafts are actually struggling because they're unable to find young people to follow on in the footsteps of the current generation of master craftsmen. In that sense, Kiriko is little unusual, but it's comforting to know that at least one traditional Japanese craft has a bright future ahead of it. I'll see you again next time. Next edition of Begin Japanology, our theme is sushi. We will be looking at the origins of this globally popular food and how it developed into its present form. The appeal of fine crystal glass was traditionally likened to that of beautiful women. The fragile light that plays across the facets of cut glass fits the Japanese aesthetic. These days, Kiriko is finding fresh applications. Glass artisans are experimenting with new uses, such as making decorative casings for computers. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we discover Kiriko, the tradition of cut glass that has developed a distinctive beauty all its own in Japan. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I've come to the Sumida area of eastern Tokyo to visit a showroom that specializes in cut glass. Let's take a look inside. And our topic for today is this, it's Kiriko, or Japanese lead crystal cut glass. You can take a look at the distinctive colors of it and the geometric patterns as well. Kiriko is created by cutting numerous intersecting lines into the surface of the glass, which then refract and reflect the light in a rather wonderful way. The art of cut glass originally came to Japan from Europe, but once it got here, the Japanese artisans began to incorporate their own modifications and innovations.
First of all, let's take a look at what it is that makes Kiriko distinctive. Inside the precincts of the Kameido Tenjin Shrine in Tokyo stands a traditional Japanese restaurant. During the summer months, many of the courses are served on tableware made of kiriko they're eating on a particular day. With kiriko to adorn the table, even an everyday meal has a luxurious feel. When I'm thinking about what to make for dinner, I'll think, well, this lettuce would look even more delicious on that dish. Even if it's just a single sausage on its own, a kiriko dish can make it seem appetizing. It really does make meals fun. In Japanese cuisine, great emphasis is placed on the presentation. When preparing a meal, besides considering the taste, plenty of thought has to go into the colors and shapes of the ingredients as well as the overall presentation. The gleam of Kiriko crystal Glassware that sparkles and glints. Gleaming goblets and cups etched with fine geometric patterns that catch and reflect the light. This is the appeal of the Japanese crystal ware known as Kiriko. Glass tableware makes a beautiful setting for Japanese cuisine. The technique for making cut glass was originally introduced from abroad. Adapted and refined by Japanese craftsmen, it became Kiriko. glassware. The gleam of the transparent glass conveys a refreshing sense of coolness. At the same time, it makes the whole meal seem more elegant. Kiriko goes very well in combination with other tableware and really helps to show off each course to its best. Our customers really appreciate our Kiriko tableware. People like to use Kiriko in their homes as well. For the Ito family, collecting Kiriko is a hobby. They have many pieces in a variety of shapes and patterns, which they select to complement whatever